Hi guys, welcome back to RAS Weekends, where today I am taking you through all the brand new economy changes to RIS version 0.6. Today's video will go through all the buildings that have been changed in 0.6. We'll go through the law buildings as well, and then we'll talk a little bit about the meta. So without further ado, let's get into our first topic. So our first area of huge changes comes with fertility and farming, guys. In vanilla, there's about three or four different fertilities. I believe low, medium, and high, and there might be a very low or a very high as well, but I can't quite remember. Whereas in 0.6, they have added into the game 14 fertility levels now. So from very, very low, from about one fertility to level 14 and this is the map for the previous update on 0.5 and you can see with this map that they haven't quite got to it at this point when they were updating the game and it's pretty much flat across the whole world there's not really that much variation whereas if we switch back to the map for 0.6 you can see in here all these different levels of fertility on this map, of course, one is red. So the red is the ones with no fertility. And of course, in the Alps, in here, in the uh, uh, the deserts, of course, as well. Up here in the far north, where it's probably a little bit either forested or too cold. Uh, and of course, two to five is the orange. So a bit better fertility in some of these regions in the orange. Um, and then six to eight is yellow. So this is getting into decent fertility levels in the yellow but then 9 to 12 for green so they're very good fertility in green and then the excellent ones 13 to 14 in the dark green and this level of farming i'm just going to show you guys right now so you can see if we come across here to birande this is a level one i believe and you can see it makes about 96 gold for farming so uh, depending on the nation, depending on the region, you're looking at about 90 base farming income per fertility level. So when we get up to level 14 fertility, you're looking at a 1,200 gold a turn just from base farming level. If we also, if you right click and uh, uh, on here, you can see which levels of fertility we have. So if we go to Mesopotamia, which is the Seleucids, I do believe it has a farm, so that will modify it slightly, but you can see 1,632 just from farming there for that very high level. Over here, I believe we've got a couple of medium ones. So if I find a medium one without a farm, let's have a look. Now that's low. So we'll have a look at another low, so not a very low one, but you can see a very uh, a low one that is a 2 to 5. You can still have decent amount, 460 uh, there. But you can see the different bases of farming really will have a big impact. So when you get onto the map, you can check that by shift right clicking on a region and it'll tell you the base farming level, as you can see there. It also tells you a bit about trade and mining, that sort of thing, if you want to. You can also tab out to the big map, and I will show you where you can find that map we were looking at before. It's down here. You press on this, and then you make sure you just tick the base farming level, and you can find out where the best fertility is around you. And this might actually inform your gameplay going forward as well, because if you want to go for an area that's a little bit richer... You might want to go for, say, this area of Carthage because of the amount of fertility. Or if you're playing Rome, you might want to go for the northeast rather than the northwest of Italy for that extra fertility because it brings a lot of base farming level and a base farming income as well. But when we build farms, guys, just to note that the farms actually make the same amount of money as, say, vanilla, and it isn't inclusive particularly of that fertility level. This is to balance out the income, the extra income you get from those extra farming levels. Because when you look at the map, most of the map is kind of yellow and above, which is levels that are higher than vanilla farming anyway. So it's just a lot more money on the map from farming in general. So one thing to note, guys, is that actually the farming buildings will make the same amount of money no matter the fertility level. 
in the settlement. For example, if we go to Seleucia and we build this communal farming and I stick it in there, you can see it only makes about 100. Whereas if I go to, say, a medium area of fertility, say down here, Ditiki, uh, Daitiki Elamias. <laughs> yes. We can't actually build a farming there. Uh, how about a large town with a medium? So, Apamea Sitakane. Say that has a high, though. So, that's lower than Seleucia. We go for the communal farming. And you can see it makes pretty much the same amount of money. And that's because across the map, if we looked at the map before, like I showed you, there is a lot of yellow and above. And the yellow fertility level is higher than the base from the highest fertility level in vanilla anyway. So you've got so much more money out there for farming, so much base fertility that they didn't tie the farms to that because it would make the farming very broken and you'd, uh, you'd make an absolute obscene amount of money. So it's just to balance that out. So when we talk about the buildings coming up from 0.5, the difference, I'm going to put it up on the screen screenshots of the buildings from 0.5 at various levels so you can actually see the difference. But if we come into the trade in here and we go down to farming. So in 0.5, the farming levels go up to level 4 for most Greeks. They don't go up to greater states as well. But they go up about half a percent of population growth per one, which is exactly the same as in 0.6. The, the increase in farmland size is also the same to 0.5 as well. Because that goes 1, 2, 3, 4. But of course we have greater states now as well. Which adds the extra level for the Greeks. The farms also increase tax income in 0.5. And they do not do that anymore. In fact, they have an extra population growth bonus there. So they actually have more population growth. So 1% there. 1.5. So it's pretty much 0.5 more than everywhere uh, else. Because they've got that extra 0.5 down there. 3%. For the irrigation, which was only 2% before. So you just get a lot more population growth. And you do not get the public order disorder from farms that you got in 0.5. In terms of the costs, you can see the costs have been adjusted quite highly. So when we're talking about costs of buildings, guys, I'll go through this again later. But generally, buildings that are military in nature or have the additional benefit of population growth have been increased in cost. So, for example, this is 3,600 in the normal uh, 0.5 game, this irrigation. But in 0.6, it's 8,000. So, to get that extra population growth, guys, you're going to have to uh, inject a lot of money. But like I say, the main bulk of your money from farming actually comes base anyway. So by increasing your farms, I would see them now not necessarily as an economic building, but as a population growth building. So rather than investing in them for money, you want to invest in them for population, which in turn gives you more money, of course, as well. So now here we are as the Parthians, guys, and they have a little bit of difference now when we talk about the herds. So the herds used to go up to level 4. Now I believe it's only two levels that you get from them. But what these herds now do is that they unlock your farming. So if I destroy this substantial herds building, guys, we'll go back into here. And we'll have back a look at trade. And you can see there's this little thing here that says, Building this item requires that you are not nomadic, so culture, so Germanic, Libyan, Scythian, or Parthian. So this is the buildings that these culture groups get. But you must have substantial herds built. So before you could build the herds and the farming, no problem whatsoever. But now you get the organized herds and just the substantial herds, whereas before it went up to the warlords herds and it was quite a good building. Now it's there so that then you can build your farming levels for your extra population growth. This, of course, is to simulate the settling down of a nomadic nation such as the Parthians, etc. Once you've got those substantial herds, it, it, it stands to reason that you might settle down and start farming. So, of course, when we compare to 0.5, these uh, herds used to start 
with a bit of a population growth, 0.5% the same. A bit of extra tax, but now it's been boosted to 10%. So in 0.5, this level was 3% and not any trade uh, either. And they used to only cost 100, although 200, I would suggest, is not too much. Substantial Herds is only 400 as well. So it's quite a good building for this. 0.5% again for the population growth. So not quite as much. Oh, it was 0.5 for the uh, uh, for the Substantial Herds last time as well. Uh, tax income bonus of 20%, which is higher than the second tier of herds last time, but not quite as much as the minor city tier of herds. And a trade income bonus on top as well. And of course, it unlocks your farming buildings. So a really cool addition and a bit of extra depth for all these nomadic uh, nation. So let's now talk about the trader line, guys. It gives a big trade income bonus, but it doesn't give quite as much as before but some of the negatives are removed from a lot of these so you'll notice when we go through these buildings some of the uh, sort of balancing um negatives have been re removed some of them so for example a building might have given 10 percent trade and minus percent minus five percent tax or something just to make it a little bit more simple they've removed some of those differences so before in 0.5 you used to get 100% extra trade in the town, the large town, so the trader, market, and the agora. And then you also used to get an extra 200% in the great agora and merchants quarter with an extra 10%, 20%, 20%, and 30% uh, of trade income bonus as well. Now, the difference, guys, between trade income bonus and increase in trade so an increase in trade is an increase in the trade goods you are trading from the land and the sea so that will give its own natural benefit per um per city based on how much trade goods it has within the city how much it's trading with outside so you can't give it a specific number to that i can't say oh that's different by 10 percent or whatever but a trade income bonus is just a percentage increase on top of your gen uh, your base trade so say your base trade is a thousand a trade income bonus of 10 percent would be a 10 percent on top of that a thousand so you'd be making 1100 then whereas that increase in trade is something slightly different and changes the base trade and it depends on what the region trades in to start with so like i say you've got that increase in trade and then you've also got the trade income bonus on top of that for 0.5 whereas when we have a look at 0.6 we've just got trade income bonus we don't have the increase in trade uh, for the first uh, trader uh, and then market trade income bonus of 50 then we get to 70 we also get a bit of law with that the greater gore at 90 and the merchant's quarter trade income bonus 100 and a bit of law and happiness so it's very much streamlined because before you used to also get a population growth of 0 0.5 0 0.5 111 and also a public order bonus for these guys we do still have that public order bonus but just everything in there has been streamlined so it's just one number now rather than a load of different things including a minus tax to all these as well so it's quite complicated before now it's just been streamlined quite a bit in terms of the costs though they're actually a little bit cheaper because they don't have that extra population growth the trader here 800 it's a thousand in the normal game actually if i remove you let's just check that that isn't because of the general <laughs> it could be you never know so let's have a look back no, it's still 800, so 800, whereas in 0.5, this is 2,400, where it's 2,000. This was at 4,200, but now the Agora is 6,000. And the Great Agora used to be 8,000, now it's 10,000 and 16,000 versus 12,000. So cheaper early on, more expensive late game. And we do see that trend carrying on quite a bit as well. The later game buildings have become more expensive, but you get a bit more freedom and uh, ability early game with a few cheaper buildings to get your economy boosted and started. So now let's talk about the ports, guys. So the ports actually have been nerfed a little bit because they were pretty OP before. They were, they were quite good. And now... With the amount of cities in the game, this is also why trade has been nerfed slightly. 
is because because there's so many more cities in the game, guys. These places will have just, in general, more base trade because they are trading with more regions around them, more regions via the, via the sea as well. So n trading has been nerfed to try and balance that out, definitely. But with ports, the ports actually don't do a huge amount of trade income bonus because the way they've simulated it, it, it is... That if sea trade comes in through the port, it's going to go through one of these buildings, one of these traders line buildings. And therefore, you're getting more of your money from this building. Whereas the ports are there as military buildings with the added addition of trade coming through them that'll be filtered through one of these in real life. So that's why the ports might seem a little bit less, a little bit more nerfed. Uh, but that is why, because to balance it out and also they put the income into the trader line. So in 0.5, used to get trade fleets plus one, two, and three, which is the same here. So I believe that's, I believe that, honestly, I think that's only visual. I don't believe that that actually has that much impact in game. We'd have to have a look into the, uh, into the code uh, for that one. But it used to reduce tax by three, uh, six, and nine percent. That has been removed, of course. Like I said, you also used to get a bit of pop growth for the dockyard, but you don't anymore. But now it's just a trade income bonus of 10, 20, and 30. So it seems low, but like I say, guys, it has been balanced with the fact that you are so many more uh, regions with th which these ports can now trade with, and so many more regions with which your uh, cities can trade overland as well. So let's talk now about river ports, guys. And again, following the same trend of the normal ports, there is slightly less bonus of trade now than there was in 0.5. In 0.5, you used to get a 200% for the river ports building, and you used to get a 400% for the inland trade center, which is honestly crazy. I I'm surprised that it was that high. To be honest, you also used to get a minus 2 and minus 4% tax, which you were obviously happy to take with such huge bonuses. The cost of these was 1,700 and 3,400. You can see now the cost is now 2,000, so only slightly bit more. Following that theme of making early game building still a little bit easier, so a still quite cheap to build early game, but then with a more expensive, better building, it's again quite expensive versus the 3,400 in 0.5. And the trade income bonus again has been slightly reduced. So 80% rather than 200 and 150% rather than 400 that it was before. And no negatives for this building as well. So quite a good building again. And like I say, those uh, that balancing is there because of the, just the amount of extra settlements, which is needed to be done. And don't worry about the economy, guys, too much. Nothing really uh, trumps um, going and conquering uh, conquering cities. So that's still going to be the meta, really, is to go and conquer as much as possible. So now let's talk about roads, guys. So back in uh, 0.5, roads were actually changed a little bit from vanilla. But now they are back to vanilla. And also, highways can now be accessed by all quote-unquote uh, civilized nations. So everyone that's not nomadic, I believe now can pretty much get a... Uh, sorry, everyone that's not tribal can now get access to these. So you're talking Carthage, all the Hellenistic nations, India, Kush, that sort of thing. So... All of these nations can now get highways, which I think is fantastic. So much better than just being able to build paved roads. And previously, the roads gave 100% for roads, and paved roads gave 200%, and a minus 6 and a minus 12% tax reduction, respectively. They'd give an increase in trade, uh, sorry, of uh, z so increase in trade income as well, of only 100% on the paved roads as well. Now we do see, so. With the roads, it has no increase in trade because it's kind of already trading with everywhere. Um, your nation, just not on roads that you've built, dirt roads. But with the paid roads, you now have a 100% increase in bonus. So 100% less uh, than previously. And then with the highways, you now have a 200% bonus in trade. So again, slightly reducing that trade bonus because again, you're going to be trading with so many more cities that it will probably... 
you know, match up and probably even be more with these negatives, guys. So, well, not negatives. With this less trade than vanilla, you're still probably going to make more from this region because it might be trading with two or three more settlements than in 0.5. So again, it's not really nerfed it at all. It's just balanced it for the amount of settlements that are out there now. In terms of the cost, these guys, uh, I believe... So if we come down to trade and go down to roads again. So the roads are now 2,600. They used to be 1,200 before. 5,000 for the paved roads and 10,000 for the highway. So again, got to sink a lot of money into these boys to get that big trade income bonus. So let's now talk about mines, guys. So in 0.5, silver and gold mines were the same. So you just had silver and gold mines, and that was that was it. Um, and they made about a thousand on the normal mines, and for the large mines, they made about two thousand with a minus four percent and minus eight percent tax debuff as well. But now in uh, 0.6 gold and silver mines have actually been split so if we come into here we have this is a perfect example Awornos Bactria because it has two different uh, versions it's got gold and silver mines ready to go uh, there but you can see gold mines actually make a thousand now and then they make 2500 and there is no negative to them whatsoever and the silver mines make 750 and then they make 1,600. So, of course, if you've got both of these resources, you're going to have both levels of mines and be an absolute mining god. Uh, but yeah, the costs as well have been increased. So it was 4,000 before, and now it's 5,000, and it was 8,000, now it's 12,000. But for that 2,500, that's still a bit of a steal. Only it's going to pay for itself in five turns, guys. That's fantastic. That is really, really really good uh really fantastic and then silver mines of course again it's it's uh so i think it's four thousand and ten thousand so again gonna pay for itself in about five turns really fantastic fantastic level of money you get from mines so if you have them available and you can afford them get them in as quick as possible because the the first level of mine is only four turns it doesn't take too long and the second level is only eight turns so it's a really good building to get in to boost your economy especially if you've got places like this where you can see if we right click and shift again you can see the mining possible very high here this is how you also find out where you've got mines as well as looking on the map as well guys if you didn't know that you can see up here we have mining possible gold so that's fantastic. But on to the temples then, guys. So I'm not going to compare to the 0.5 temples, guys, because um, there's just a, been a, quite a few different little changes to the temples, and it'd be an absolute nightmare to explain them. I'd just confuse all of you. But I'll just tell you the temples that get new money bonuses now. Or not new money bonuses, or just money bonuses for you so you have the temple of farming which is the temple of demeter if you're greek this of course applies to all the cultures guys but obviously every nation has about three temples three different temples so of course the different cultures aren't going to be it's not going to be called the temple of demeter it'll be a temple of what other uh, other gods that they are worshiping and of course the temple of farming gives a farming level bonus per level uh, the Temple of Fun, which is the Temple of Dionysius, gives a tax bonus. The Temple of Healing, uh, which I believe is the Temple of Asclepius, or As uh, sorry, Asclepius, which I've tried to find, but I think is a very rare temple for the nations. I've been tagging around nations for ages trying to find this guy. But at the Pantheon level, gives a little bit of a trade bonus. Only the Pantheon level, however. But the Temple of Hunting, which for the Greeks is Artemis, gives a large trade bonus. And at Pantheon, it gives a farming bonus as well. Now, the Temple of Love, which is Aphrodite, of course, for the Greeks, at the Pantheon level, gets a trade bonus. And the Temple of the Navy, which is the Poseidon Temple, gives a pretty nice tax bonus as well. Now, the Temple of Trade, which I believe is Hermes, gives a trade bonus and at the Pantheon a large trade bonus, but only for land trade. The Temple of Victory and Fortune Nike 
gives a tax bonus and at the Pantheon level a trade bonus. Now the Temple of Violence and War, the Temple of Ares, gives a Pantheon trade bonus. And there is also the Temple of Tyche. Uh, which on the list I have uh, listed as the Temple of One God, but I believe that refers to Zeus, but we'll call it the Temple of One God. Uh, well, no, let's not call it that, because that's uh, that's not right. But uh, the Temple of Tyche as well also gives a really good trade bonus, so I guess uh, the Temple of Trade could be Tyche or Hermes, really, in there. It gives a really good uh, trade bonus. But the Temple of the One God, for example, like the Zeus, gives building cost reduction for military building so a lot of these temples will also give construction cost reductions as well which are actually not to be sniffed at now with the ex um, really expensive say late game military buildings that you're going to try and get so if you go to say a late game military building over here like the royal barracks 10,000 a 10 percent reduction in the costs there would be uh would be really good um you know that's an extra thousand removed from the cost of that. So a lot of temples will have varying differences, not just those base bonuses to trade and tax, uh, which is really, really cool. So let's talk a little bit about the way money can be taken away and the building costs and building times. So in terms of recruitment and upkeep, guys, like we mentioned in the gameplay video with Mosca, all recruitment is now two turns. Now, that is for two reasons. Firstly, because it's now four turns per year. So it's simply the same time scale, just two turns. And secondly, it's to stop you trying to blitz and just leaving, uh, trying to recruit like one Akontistai in the settlement and then you're done. It's to make gameplay more strategic for where you're going to conquer and how you're going to garrison it and keep it happy afterwards as well. Now, during that gameplay interview, we did get a lot of comments below saying, why can't you make the levy and the rubbish units one turn? Now, there's a big reason for that, guys. It's because if you do that, what generally tends to happen is that the AI will much prefer to recruit the one-turn units. It doesn't mean they won't recruit any two-turn uh, two units, but say, for example... Uh, all of these units from Greek, uh, from Macedonian hoplites down were one turns. If you were playing the Antigonids in game and you were getting some good two turn units like Chalka Speeders, etc., you would just be fighting Macedonian armies predominantly made of these units. And uh, that, of course, impacts the game negatively. So everything is now two turns, uh, and that is the recruitment time. But the upkeeps have been adjusted, and it's been adjusted kind of on a. Uh, a basis per unit so i can't give you a, a, a statistic i can't say it's been increased or reduced by 10 percent but we can compare to 0 0.5 and i'll use the antigonids as an example here so we can get the greek hoplite i believe so here's a greek hoplite guys for 0 0.6 and in 0 0.5 it costs 1766 and it has uh, 874 upkeep Whereas now we can see that the actually the upkeep is slightly reduced, 580. And it's also 1,585 versus 1,766. So for the Greek hoplite, it's actually reduced, making recruiting troops and conquering a little bit easier for you guys, even if it does take a couple of turns to recruit these boys. But let's also uh, go to, say, the Zistaphorite. So in 0.5, the recruitment of the Zistaphoria is 1,023, and the upkeep is 506. Whereas here we can see it's more expensive. So you can see sort of the more useful units, the stronger units, have had their upkeep increased. And some of the cheaper, more levy units, that the worst units that aren't going to see you into the late game, have had their recruitment reduced. What this means is that early game, you can get a decent army a bit easier now. You can get a decent uh, larger army a little bit easier but then to upgrade that army into a more uh, expensive and better equipped army it's going to cost you a little bit more money so like i say it's not an, an exact percentage per one it's been uh, changed on the basis of the unit so uh, you're just going to have to play the game and experiment yourself to find out exactly how much it has changed but let's talk a little bit about building costs and turns as well guys so like I said earlier, the building costs have kind of been increased 
for a lot of the later game buildings, the uh, the large city, huge city buildings, because that's to simulate, you know, making the late game a little bit more difficult so you can't snowball quite so easily. But, of course, uh, some of the earlier game units, like uh, maybe not the military buildings, but some of the earlier game economic buildings are actually now cheaper, like we can see. You know, land clear is 600 rather than 800. I think the communal farm is actually the same, but, you know... So some of these buildings have had a reduction in cost early game. And that will, of course, give you a little bit more money to play with early game and then have to invest heavily later game to get upgrades into these larger cities. In terms of the turns to build, all buildings are now at least two turns to build. So you can't just put in a shrine to Hera in every settlement straight away just to easily decrease, uh, easily increase the order after you've conquered it. It's now going to take you a little bit more strategic planning of where to conquer and what to build. And uh, most buildings are now four to six turns. And it makes sense, guys, because again, we've gone from two turns per year to four turns per year as well. This, of course, with the, uh, for example, the temples... Uh, it stops people blitzing quite as much, unfortunately for me, but <laughs> it stops people blitzing quite as much and makes conquest more realistic because you're likely to get more unrest initially when you conquer a settlement before you take the two turns to build, say, a law building, for example. Uh, and, of course, late game buildings are more expensive in general and take a little bit of extra time, so stuff like... The Great Estates, that's 15,000. It takes 10 turns. You can see the Secret Police Network, 14,008 turns. The Foundry, 16,010 turns. Some of these barracks, 10 turns, 10,000. Actually, not too bad. 15,010 turns for the Megas Hippodromos. Um, so, yeah, making cavalry more expensive as well. Uh, but, yeah, that's just to make the late game less snowbally and more challenging. For all of you guys that struggle with the early game, don't worry about that at all. That is not a problem for you because early game, you're not going to have any large cities or huge cities. You might have one or two minor cities at most if you're playing one of these smaller nations. But even if you're playing the Seleucids, I believe there's only one large city and it's Seleucia. And if you're playing the Ptolemies, I believe there's one large city and it's Alexandria. So really, you don't need to worry about that for quite some time until you've got your population up to the next level so in 0.6 guys there are also buildings that give tax penalties now they've tried to balance this out uh, like i said before and not have tax penalties on like everything like we've seen so like not uh, on, on buildings that give you money it's just to amalgamate it and just give you money rather than a tax penalty and also a trade bonus just so it's less confusing but some of these buildings that are that don't give you money will give you a tax penalty so for example the walls will give you minus five percent tax income for every single tier so it's only minus five percent so once you built the wooden palisade it's already in so it doesn't matter if you go above that it's not going to keep increasing there's also the um, barracks as well so all the barracks and the stables ranges so the barracks it goes five six seven and eight and for the stables it's the same five to eight and with the practice range of course we only have three levels so it goes five six seven so of course building these military buildings less tax income for you the same with the siege it goes minus seven to minus eight the smith goes a little bit differently it goes minus two percent minus five percent and minus eight percent and of course, we looked at them before, but the roads, guys, the roads do give a bit of a negative, a minus 10%, uh, sorry, a minus 5 and then a minus 10% for the paved roads and highways. So let's now talk about one of my favorite topics in Rome Total War, guys, and it is corruption and law. Now, corruption is a measure of how corrupt your city is away from your capital so the further away your city is from your capital it goes uh, it stands for reason that the city is going to be more corrupt and corruption can scale all the way up to 65 percent guys so 65 percent of your income lost to corruption here we can see it's probably about 
30%, but yeah, it can go up to 65%, and that starts at 100 tiles away. Um, but from 20 tiles away from your capital, corruption starts at 4%. So make sure that you are looking at your corruption very early game to see where your corrupt regions are, especially away from your capital. Because 20 tiles on this map, guys, is not very far. <laughs> so if you're playing the Seleucids, pretty much everywhere from the edge of Mesopotamia is corrupt. So you want to make sure that you are building law buildings in all of these places. So every 5% law reduces corruption by 5%. And of course, with governors as well, every influence, I believe, equals 5% law as well. So if they got 10 influence, they got 50% law for you to reduce that uh, corruption with as well. So law reduces corruption, guys. So let's go through the buildings that you can reduce uh, corruption with. And actually, in 0.6... There's actually more options for law. There's more ability to have extra law. So let's talk first of all about the government buildings. In 0.5, the government buildings give 5%, 10%, 15, 15, and 15% law. Whereas now in 0.6, it goes 5, 10, 15, 20, 25. So even at Royal Palace, you get that nice 25% law, which is fantastic. Extra law just from your government building. Let's also talk about the walls, guys, because before in the game, there was no point building your walls up in an inland city, in a city that was far away from the front line. Why would you ever build your walls up then? Because in terms of the law, you got 0, 0, 5, 5, and 10, so it's not worth building those epic stone walls at all. Whereas in 0 0.6, guys, it again goes 5, 10, 15, 20, and 25. So it gives an extra reason to build the walls, or at least a reason to build the walls in those inland cities, of course. So it makes building walls worthwhile now, which I think is fantastic. Fantastic. Let's now talk about the execution squares, guys. And of course, a really good, re uh, really good way of uh, giving you extra law in the game. And of course, we go 10, 15, and 20% law here. So different. It's exactly the same as 0.5, uh, 10, 15, and 20. So of course, really good way of getting extra law, and it gives no negatives as well no negatives it's just a law building so for example we are the seleucids over here so imagine you're over here as the seleucids a long way away from seleucia in anatolia over here in sardis and we have 947 corruption here which is huge guys huge but if we build the execution square you can see that 10 percent law is giving you 138 gold so whereas if we built that, although that's quite a lot, actually, that uh, that trader. Um, but yeah, it's going to give you loads of gold. So when you are building, guys, make sure that there isn't a law building that will give you more money per turn than an economic building. Because if there's a cheaper law building going, build that instead. Because you'll actually make more money that way than actually building something in some cases that will directly give you money because you're going to lose some of that money to corruption anyway. So do keep an eye on that the whole time. Along with that, the Great Agora and the Merchant's Quarter now give you some law. So if we come across there here, we can see the Great Agora gives you 10% law, which is really nice. And in the merchant's quarter you also get another you get 10 percent and five percent in the agora but you didn't get any law for these buildings in 0.5 in fact you got a tax reduction bonus so this really does help you out with your law and your late trade buildings as well so it's a double-edged sword they will give you trade income and reduce your corruption as well and then of course with the academies down here is this the academy no that's the arena so that's the odeon so the academies it's exactly the same as 0.5 you get 5 10 and 15 percent law from the academies as well and if you are a nation that gets it you will get five percent law from the bardic circle 
as well. Obviously, you don't get that as the Greeks. I believe it's the Celts will get those buildings. Uh, Celts and Germans, maybe? Uh, I'm not exactly 100% sure because I always play in this region because it's done. Uh, but yeah, 5% law for the Bardic Circle as well. So let's talk about our final way to reduce your corruption and get law, and that is with temples. Now, all of these temples give a bonus of 5, 10, 15, 20, and 25% law for their levels, respectively, from town to a huge city. Now, of course, most nations will get access to a law temple, guys. Not all of them, but most will, so that you get the ability to have extra law in some of your faraway provinces. Now, for these temples, we have the Temple of Governors, we've got the Temple of Justice, which I believe is the Temple of Nemesis, the Temple of Law, which is Athena, the Temple of Leadership, which I believe is Atlas, and the Temple of the One God, which I think in this case is Hera. So, yeah, you get uh, plenty of access. With the Seleucids, of course, you get the Temple of Hera, which is uh, fantastic. If you've watched my Seleucid campaign, guys, go and check it out. But uh, we have pretty much built this temple everywhere <laughs> because we need the law because our empire's so big. Uh, but yeah, this, uh, as well as this, of course, lots of different temples give different bonuses to uh, construction costs all that sort of thing as well. And of course, there are military temples still in the game, but we are just talking about economy right now, aren't we? So, let's talk a little bit about the meta going forward. And of course, let's first talk about law. Like I said, if you are starting as a small nation, you do not need to worry about law to start with at all. So if you're starting small, don't worry about law. Don't do anything with it until you get to a point 20 tiles away when you start having corruption. So even small nations, though, that's not too far away. So you do want to be on the lookout for it relatively early on. Whereas if you're starting large, like the Ptolemies, like the Seleucids, even the Antigonids and the Romans, you will get corruption in your faraway provinces. So always look to reduce the corruption in some of your faraway provinces. For example, if I look at Thyatira here, it's making 571 a turn. That's terrible, but it could be making 1,164 if we get rid of the law. So when you are building in these faraway provinces, guys, make sure you're prioritizing law buildings and looking to see whether any economy buildings will actually make more money than the law buildings and vice versa. Which way round is best? But you should not be building in your faraway provinces to start with. What you should be doing is building right next to your capital. So, for example, the Seleucids, you want to build in Babylon. You want to build in Mesopotamia. This is where you want to build and focus your economy early on, where you're not going to get corruption that just unneedlessly removes money from you. There's no point building up here in Alexandria Prosphasia or Karakata or anything like that. Do not build there because there's no point. If I look at this, look at this here. How much corruption do we have? Like, it's half the amount of money. So as soon as I build that in, you're losing half of that money straight away to corruption. So no point building in there. Come down here. Let's do the same thing in one of these places. Uh, let's uh, do that in there in Alexandria Charax. You can see this even has loads of corruption down here. So even closer, really, you want to get and start building those farms where you don't have any corruption. So you want to build right near your capital, your economic powerhouse first. That is what you want to do first. But then let's talk about the meta. So like I say, if you're a small nation, that doesn't apply to you because all your regions will be close to your capital. But for these big regions, that's what you want to do. Then building wise, you want to have a look at your fertility around. And you will find that you will have much more farming money coming in. Now, that doesn't necessarily mean, like I said, that building a farm will actually make too much difference. Um, because the farming, like we've said before, is actually just the vanilla amount of farming. So this land clearance here, for example, uh, land clearance here, it's going to make 100, which is quite good. That is not bad at all. How about the shrine to here? That's going to take away 34. So it's definitely better building the farms. 
But how about the trader? Let's have a look. Only three because this region does not trade very well with others. But what you want to do is you want to min-max your whole economy. Go through every single region. Look for the most cost-effective buildings. Not the buildings that give the biggest plus value. The ones that will give you the biggest plus value versus the turn time. So, for example, the trader only takes two turns to build. I believe the trader. Yeah, two turns. So, it, this one is making 31. Uh, it's costing 800. So, it's going to take a long time for it to pay itself back, especially with that 18 corruption. Whereas, if we have a look at here, 602 turns. So, this makes about 50, but it only costs 600. So, it's going to pay itself back in 12 turns. That's a lot better than what the trader did. So, it's worth building the land clearance. So that's what you want to go through and, of course, adjust all your tax rates in all your cities as well. But building-wise, you want to go through and just look for the best ones. I would suggest that farming very early on is still the best thing to build along with mines. Then what you want to do, if you build around your capital, is start increasing trade buildings in these regions. Once the farmings are up to good level, once you've built all your mines, then start looking at trade. Because there's so many regions in here now that these areas are going to be trading like crazy with each other. So make sure you then you move on to trade. So I'd say that's still pretty much the meta from my experience. Building farms and mines first, then on to trade. And make sure you always min-max your economy, guys. That's, that's my key tip of the day. Min-maxing the economy is the best thing you can do to make more money. But anyway, guys, we're also going to do a video on public order and happiness and how to keep your settlements happy going forward in the game. That might be out next week or this week. Not 100% sure because everyone is very short for time right now, the mod team and me. So, yeah, we'll see when that comes out. But whenever you get this video, I hope you have enjoyed, guys. I hope it's explained a few things, shown you the differences for 0.6. And hopefully there's just a lot more money going around. So the economy should just be a little bit easier. But anyway, guys, thank you very much for watching. Please do like and subscribe. It really does help the channel out. And I will see you all again on the next video.